Would you please take your Bibles, and uh, we're going to go to uh, two texts here in the book of Genesis. The first one, if you want to keep your place in Genesis 45, and then uh, keep another place there in Genesis chapter 50. So we're going to be in uh, reading two verses now. Uh, we've uh, gone through the entire book of Genesis, and uh, uh, certainly there is much more that could be said. Um, we're on uh, message 99, believe it or not, it's been a few years since we've uh, gone through the book of Genesis. And uh, from Genesis 37 through Genesis chapter 50, the focus is mainly on Joseph. Uh, from the moment you find him at 17 years of age and uh, you find at the end of the book of Genesis his death. And as we've studied through the book of Genesis, as we study any book... It's important for us to always recognize the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, in the book of Hebrews, in, uh, you can keep it place here in Genesis 45, but in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7, the Bible, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, then said, I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Now, talking about Christ, the volume of the book referring to the Old Testament that it is written of Christ, what is it written all about? About the Lord Jesus Christ doing the will of God. In Luke 24, 27, you remember after Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead and he spent some time with his disciples before his ascension. Uh, in Luke 24, 27, he says, And beginning at Moses, that's Jesus Christ, and all of the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Uh, another portion of scripture tells us that he began in Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms even. The, thir the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we look to the Bible, is it very important for us to understand that this entire book is about one person. The Lord Jesus Christ. The revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, in Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that Jesus Christ is the express image of the person of God. Uh, and so if we want to know God, we have to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the, go the gospel according to John was written, uh, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And that believing on him, the Lord Jesus Christ, they might have life through his name. And so the entirety of the Bible is about one person, and that is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we think about the entirety of the Bible revelation, I would like to put it this way. We find the four shadows of Christ observed in the historical books from Genesis to Esther. We find the feelings of Christ are expressed in the poetic books from the book of Job to the book of the Song of Solomon. We find the foretelling of Christ in the prophetic books of Isaiah through Malachi. We find the facts about Christ recorded in the Gospel of Matthew to the Gospel of John. We see the followers of Christ in the book of Acts. We find the fruits of Christ written in the epistles from Romans to the book of Jude. And finally, we see the future of Christ is found in the book of Revelation. And the point we make is the entire Bible is about the Lord Jesus Christ. From the announcement in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 concerning the seed of the woman, our attention is drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the entire Bible. And we know that the end of all things is that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And with this revelation that we hold in our hands right here directly from God, we can do that now, today, as Christians. In Genesis chapter 45, now we've completed our study of the book of Genesis and there's certainly much... Uh, abler men that could probably do a better job, and perhaps we could go a whole lot longer on the book of Genesis. But I want to focus just a moment on Joseph, and particularly two passages. The first one in Genesis 45, right after Joseph has made himself known to his brothers, 
Uh, they did not know him up until this time. Notice with me in Genesis 45 and go down to verse 4. The Bible says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Joseph was sold by his brothers as a slave. And he said, God sent me to save you by a great deliverance. What a perspective from Joseph. If you go to chapter 50. Now, in chapter 50, Jacob has passed away, also known as Israel. And now the brothers, now that Jacob their father has passed, we read that they are in fear that Joseph might avenge himself. Uh, it is uh, proving to us that they uh, did not have a good opinion of Joseph, their brother. Uh, and the Bible says, notice with me, verse 14 of Genesis 50, And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all of the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and said, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear not, fear ye, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. On two occasions, when Joseph reflects and his brothers are thinking about the evil that they've done towards Joseph, on the two occasions when you can see that they sense the guilt and their evil, Joseph makes the point to say that God sent him to save them. Twice Joseph makes that remark. The lives of those who were Joseph's enemies were saved by the life of Joseph. Uh, perhaps that is why in those statements, many times as we come to the scriptures, we often say that Joseph is a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me put a disclaimer here. Whenever you try to find an example or a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible, I think that we all understand that any man will always be inadequate to perfectly represent and picture the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we all understand that. Uh, that the person of Christ speaks for himself, but the entirety of the revelation of God's Word points to us, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and often God will use individual personalities, characters, events, to show us how they picture or foreshadow the Lord Jesus Christ, particularly in the book of Genesis. We see that all throughout, beginning in Genesis chapter 3, if you remember, as soon as man sinned and God sought for man in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, God pronounced a curse with man, and He not only cursed man, but He cursed the creation, Romans 8 tells us, in hope. 
You see, because as soon as the curse was pronounced, then he said that the head of the serpent would be bruised by the seed of the woman. Well, that seed is very important because part of the reason why we have the Old Testament record is to trace that seed of the woman all the way to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. When God came to Abraham and called him out of Ur of the Chaldee, it was for a particular purpose. Uh, we know that there was the promise of the land. There was the promise of uh, a throne. But particularly there was the promise of the seed. And the book of Galatians, Paul expounded on this thought from the Old Testament. And he goes back and he says, When Abraham was uh, received the message of a seed... He did not understand it as seeds, as in plural. He understood it as the seed, which is Christ. So we're talking about the seed, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, the seed of Jacob, and so on. And we keep moving our way through the Old Testament. Understand what we're talking about, the lineage of Messiah. The lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ, it points us into one direction, and that is the future advent of Messiah who will come, as John the Baptist said, to take away the sin of the world. That is the theme of the Bible. Now, I'm not going to preach on the whole Bible, but I want to focus a little while on, on Joseph. And as, I, as we worked our way through the life of Joseph from Genesis 37 all the way to Genesis chapter 50, we've made some points, we've taken some truth from the Scriptures. But I want to give you, and um, I don't know what the total number is, maybe we'll finish it in this uh, message, maybe we won't. But I, I want to give us some ways in which Joseph pictures or represents the Lord Jesus Christ or some things we find happening in the life of Joseph that also happen in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and why we contend that Joseph is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we'll make our way back to those two references that I read just a moment ago. And I'll try to go at it in a chronological way. Now, sometimes it's not going to fit that way, but uh, I'm going to do my best here to See how Joseph pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go, if you would, with me to Genesis chapter 37, the first time we read about Joseph. And I want us to have in mind, as we work our way in the life of Joseph, we know where this is ending. Okay, We know the whole story. We have the Bible fully revealed to us, so nothing is a surprise to us as we move our way through the life of Joseph. But we know where this ends. It ends in the salvation, the physical deliverance, the physical salvation of those who were Joseph's enemies. As we begin reading in Genesis 37, we come to verse 2, and the Bible says, These are the generations of Jacob. And then we are introduced, uh, we were earlier in Genesis 31 when Joseph was born, but this now we are introduced to the life of Joseph that begins in Genesis 37 and courses through the remainder of the book of Genesis. And here we find that Joseph being 17 years of age, the Bible says, 70 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And so Joseph is first seen in the Bible as a shepherd. That's interesting. The first thing we learn about Joseph, not only his age, but also the fact that he was a shepherd feeding the flock with his brethren. And the interesting thing that we know about the Lord Jesus Christ is he said himself in John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, Jesus Christ is called the chief shepherd. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20, he is called the great shepherd of the sheep. And so the first thing we see about Joseph is that he was a shepherd. As we look here again in verse number 2, we see that Joseph stood out among his peers. The Bible says here he was 17 years of age. Now we know as we keep reading that uh, he gave the evil report of his brother to his father uh, his father trusted him, and he, so he gave him a coat that represented uh, authority over his brethren. 
Uh, we know his brethren envied him, but here what we learn about Joseph is that he stood out among his peers, being only 17 years of age. As we read about the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 2, verse 46, the Bible says that everyone that heard when Jesus was speaking were astonished at his understanding and answers. He was 12 years of age. He stood out among his peers in the same way that Joseph stood out among his peers. Joseph opposed the evil of his brethren. We read in verse 2, Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. And the Bible makes it very clear that in the same way Jesus Christ, in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9, is said to hate iniquity. He loves righteousness and he hates iniquity. And we read the same truth about Joseph early on in his life. As we keep reading in verse 3 of Genesis 37, the Bible says, Now Israel, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. What we see about Joseph, Joseph was beloved of his father. Uh, in other words, there was a special affection for Joseph as he was found to be the recipients of this coat of many colors. And in the same way, Jesus Christ is the beloved Son of God. Matthew 3.17, a voice that came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And if you would, just as the coat represents that Joseph was beloved, so the Spirit of God coming down upon Christ represents that He is the beloved Son of God. As we keep reading in verse 4, we find that Joseph was hated of his brothers. In verse 4, the Bible says, When his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all of his brethren, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably unto him. They hated him. And yet we, we study the Lord Jesus Christ and we find that Jesus Christ was hated of His brethren. In John 7, 4, the Bible says, "If that's the brethren talking to Jesus, if thou do these things, show thyself to the world, for neither did His brethren believe in Him. In other words, there was this... Uh, this uh, despising from Jesus' brethren. Uh, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, came unto His own, and His own received Him not. We also know, as we study Genesis 37, that Joseph was hated without a cause. Uh, indeed, he was hated, we could say, for righteousness' sake. In uh, uh, chapter 37, verse 5, Joseph, remember, dreamed a dream. He told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. In verse 8, his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more. In other words, you see, the hater, hatred is growing. The more they're around Joseph, the more their hatred for him is growing. And in the same way, Jesus Christ was a hated of the world. John 15, 27, the Bible says, They hated me without a cause. There was no reason to hate the Lord Jesus Christ, neither was there any reason to hate Joseph. But yet they are hated. And by the way, the Lord Jesus Christ affirmed the same truth to His disciples when He said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding. Blessed are ye when ye are persecuted for righteousness' sake. We keep going with Joseph. Joseph, remember, was promised a glorious future. Right here in Genesis 37, the dream meant that his brethren would bow down to him, and in a sense that Joseph would be glorified or held up in esteem in the presence of his brethren where they would make obeisance to him, as we find it in verse 7 and 9. Well, 
When Jesus Christ was announced as the Messiah to Mary the, uh, by the angel in Luke 1.32, you remember what the angel said to Mary? And the Lord God shall give unto him, he's talking about the child that's going to be born of you, unto him the throne of his father David. And so Jesus Christ, there was an announcement that not only he would come and die for the sins of the world, but also that he would be glorified. And we know very well that at the name of Jesus Christ, Every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue shall confess, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We also find in Genesis 37 that Joseph was envied of his brethren. In verse 11, the Bible says his brethren envied him. Do you remember what Pilate said? When he recognized the same truth about Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 12, verse 14, he said the Pharisees, or the, he knew for envy they, the Jews, had delivered him. You see, the Jews, they looked at the Lord Jesus Christ and they envied him. Joseph was also envied. Joseph was Furthermore, in Genesis 37, Joseph was conspired against and the evil was done to him in verse 18 when they saw him afar off. Remember, as Jacob sent him to do his will, the Bible says even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. In the same way was Jesus Christ conspired against to be slain on many occasions such as Matthew 12, 14, where the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. And that not just, it didn't just happen once, it happened many times throughout the course of the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also find in Genesis 37 that Joseph's enemies tried to nullify the promises concerning him. You remember in verse 20 when they see their brother coming afar off, verse 20, Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into the pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Why were they trying to get rid of him? Because they didn't want those promises, those things uh, that he had revealed in his dreams to come to pass. And so therefore, uh, Joseph's enemies tried to nullify the promises concerning Joseph in the same way Herod, when he heard of the birth of Messiah, he tried to nullify the promises concerning Jesus Christ by trying to kill all the infants that had been born in Matthew chapter 2. Joseph was furthermore stripped of his garments. In Genesis 37 verse 23, the Bible says they stripped Joseph out of his coat. In the same way, Jesus Christ was stripped of his garment in Matthew 27, 28. The Bible says, and they stripped him. Joseph was um, furthermore betrayed and sold by those who knew him. In Genesis 37, 28, uh, notice what the Bible says. Verse 28, then there passed by Midianites merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. In the same way, Jesus Christ was betrayed and sold by one of his disciples who knew him in Matthew 26, 15, for 30 pieces of silver. I think we could add that both Joseph and Christ were sold for much less than what they were worth. Joseph's garments, you remember, were dipped in blood by his enemies. In Genesis 37, notice with me verse 31, And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in blood. In other words, this act of ridding themselves of Joseph by dipping his vesture in blood would turn out to be their salvation. In the same way, Revelation 19.13 tells us that Jesus Christ is said 
to be clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. This act of the Jews to rid themselves of Jesus Christ turned out to be for their salvation. Joseph, we know, was humbled from a place of glory and prestige to become a lowly servant. Jesus Christ, in the same manner, humbled himself by taking the form of a servant, according to Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. As we go over to Genesis chapter 39, when Joseph is sold to uh, Potiphar, who becomes his master, we find that Joseph made Potiphar the recipient of God's blessings because of what he did. The Bible tells us in Genesis 39 verse 5, And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And so Joseph made Potiphar the recipient of God's blessings because of what he did and who he was. And in the same way, Jesus Christ makes all sinners recipients of God's blessing of salvation because of what he did. In John 1, 12, But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We also find then in Genesis 39, Joseph went through a great temptation experience from which he was found victorious. In the same way, Jesus Christ went through a great temptation experience as recorded in Matthew chapter 4. We also find that Joseph was falsely accused for committing a sin that he did not commit. In verse 14 of Genesis 39, the Bible says, And she called unto the men of her house, and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in an Hebrew unto us to mock us, and he came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And so Joseph was falsely accused by uh, Potiphar's wife. In the same way, Jesus Christ was falsely accused by false witnesses. In Matthew 26, 59, the Bible says that the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. But then the Bible tells in verse 16, and at last came two false witnesses. What is interesting is we find that Joseph was sentenced by a man in Potiphar who was unconvinced of his guilt. Now, I studied Genesis 39. We studied that, and I showed you how I don't think that Potiphar believed his wife because if he did then Joseph would have been dead. Okay? There's no servant that survives such a accusation. As a Hebrew, in the custody of an Egyptian, we find that I don't believe that Potiphar um, was convinced by Joseph's guilt, and so Joseph was sentenced by a man in Potiphar who was unconvinced of his guilt. And in the same way, Jesus Christ was sentenced by a man, namely Pilate, who was also unconvinced of his guilt. In John chapter 19, verse 6, Pilate said, I find no fault in him. We know that Joseph was innocent of any wrongdoing, but yet he suffered a punishment. In the same manner, Jesus Christ was innocent of any wrongdoing, and yet he suffered the death, for the death for the guilty. We find that Joseph, and if you think about it, Joseph suffered in the stead of the truly guilty party. Who was that? Potiphar's wife. And yet Jesus Christ also suffered in the stead of a guilty party, namely in Barabbas. You remember when they would bring out during that time of year a prisoner to release and Pilate thought that he was going to be able to let Jesus Christ go because he was doing a lot of good things and so he brought a Barabbas, a murderer and a thief 
A man who had committed insurrection, and he thought to himself that the people would not want Barabbas, but they ended up picking Barabbas. And so Barabbas, who was guilty, goes free, and Jesus, who was innocent, is crucified. But it is not only that. Jesus Christ suffered in the stead of all men as he died for the sin of every man. Hebrews 2.9 says, We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We also find that Joseph brought comfort to others in his time of suffering. You remember as we find him in prison in Genesis chapter 40 verse 7, he is comforting those who have been in prison under Pharaoh, the chief baker and the chief butler, in the same way, and that was while Joseph was suffering, and in the same way Jesus Christ brought comfort to his mother Mary, and again I'm not saying that as any reverence or deity about Mary, but as his earthly father that brought him into this world uh, as she was a virgin. Uh, but we find here that Jesus Christ brought comfort to Mary by providing a home for her in John 19 when he instructed his disciple to make place room for his mother. In time of suffering, he found time to comfort. He also, by the way, com comforted the thief on the cross. When he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That was while he was suffering. Joseph was the man by which God brought peace to man, namely Pharaoh. In Genesis chapter 41 verse 16 we read that Pharaoh was satisfied with the interpretation of the dream and he was at peace. Remember he was troubled, he couldn't sleep, he didn't know what to do. And God used Joseph to bring peace to man. And in the same way, Jesus Christ is the man by which God brings peace to all men. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph was a great counselor to many and especially to Pharaoh the king. As we read of his counsel in Genesis 41 verse 30 through the 36, that he says you need to Appoint a man who is discreet and wise that you may appoint over this business. And Pharaoh said, I don't know of anyone that is as discreet and wise as you. You are a great counselor. And so therefore, I'm going to give you that position. While well, Jesus Christ is declared to be wonderful counselor. And Isaiah 9 verse 6. Joseph was recognized for being discreet and wise above all the men in Egypt. In Genesis 41, verse 37 through 39, And Jesus Christ is said to having taught with authority, not like the scribes. We also find that Joseph was given great authority. In Genesis 41, verse 40 and 41, Verse 40, Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Wow. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Jesus Christ as well has been given great authority. John 5, 26, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment. We also find that Joseph's enemies bowed down before him. Genesis 42, you remember? When the brothers first come to Egypt and they want food, they're dying for because of the famine. They, the Bible says in Genesis 42, verse 6, Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And we're going to find them again and again throughout the next chapters after that, bowing, themse bowing themselves down before Joseph, their brother. And the Bible tells us that before Jesus Christ, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, every knee will bow. 
What is interesting in, his, in Genesis, going back a little bit in Genesis 41, when Joseph began his, what we would say, his public, visible ministry as the second in command, he was 30 years old. When Jesus Christ began his public ministry, according to Luke 3.23, he was 30 years old. We also find that Joseph provided food to those who came to, him, to, who came to him during a famine. Genesis 41, verse 55. And Jesus Christ said of himself, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And all who came to Joseph had all their needs provided for. Joseph, furthermore, was seen as the only answer to the famine. Uh, notice with me in chapter 49, uh, 41, excuse me, Genesis 41. Notice down with me in verse 55. The Bible says, And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread, and Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph. <laughs> what he saith to you, do. Wow. You remember what Peter said? We've been studying in the book of Acts Sunday mornings. Peter made it clear when he talked about Jesus Christ, when he says, there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And for the time in Genesis 41, there's no, nobody else to go to except Joseph. And so in the same way for salvation, there is no one to go to but the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Joseph's betrayers dealt with guilt over the evil that they had done to Joseph. Remember, first of all, when Joseph had dealt harshly with them, they thought to themselves, oh, we, this is probably because of what we've done to him, and there was that guilt that was there. And that guilt, by the way, would never leave all the way up to the death of their father when Jacob passes on. They're still feeling this guilt that Joseph is going to exercise revenge, although that was not in his mind at all. But Joseph's betrayer, betrayers dealt with guilt over the evil that they had done to Joseph. And Jesus Christ's betrayer, namely Judas, dealt with a guilt as well to the point of suicide over the evil that he had done in betraying the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph, you remember, he spoke kindly to those who had done evil to him in chapter 45. We just read it a moment ago from verse 4 down to verse 8. What a kind response from Joseph as he's uh, revealing himself to his brothers. And the Bible tells us very clearly that Jesus Christ responded kindly to his rejecting brethren in Nazareth. In Luke 4.22, after they rejected him, the Bible says, all wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. That's Jesus Christ. Joseph brought his enemies in that they might serve him. In the same way, Jesus Christ brings his enemies in that they might present their bodies a living sacrifice. Now, lest you forget who the enemies we're talking about is, that's you and me. We were the enemies of God, but we have been reconciled by the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been brought in to, to serve God. We also find that Joseph invited the weary ones in chapter 45, verse 9. He, uh, his command is clear. Uh, he says, Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. He said, Come unto me. <laughs> and Jesus Christ, in the same way, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, says, Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Joseph was the chosen one by whom God would provide for his people during time of need. And in the same way, Jesus Christ is such for the Christian. Philippians 4.19 tells us, 
But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in Christ Jesus. Joseph had to go through deep poverty as demonstrated in his slavery and furthermore in his imprisonment so that others might not have to go through poverty. You see, the brothers that had done evil to him, Joseph, the only road for him to get to the throne, the second command in Egypt was for him to go through the pit, for him to go through slavery, for him to go through the imprisonment, that he might do what? That he might deliver his own enemies, his own brethren, from the place of famine, when they were in desperate need. And so he went through poverty so that his brothers would not have to go through poverty. And Jesus Christ, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, He became poor, that through His poverty we might be made rich. Joseph enabled those who came to Him. Notice in Genesis 45, verse 21, the Bible says, And the children of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh, and gave them provision for the way. So guess what? When Joseph said, all right, go get your father. Here, here's provision. Here's the wagon. Everything you need for the journey and back. And when you come here, I will provide for you. I will care for you. I will take care of you and your little ones. You will not have need uh, uh, as long as you are under me. You see, Joseph enabled those who would come unto him. And in the same way, Jesus Christ... In Jesus Christ, the believer finds that he can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. Philippians 4.13 We also see that Joseph brought his brothers before the throne. You remember? The same men who were guilty of evil against him. Genesis 47, notice verse 2. And he took some of his brethren even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. So Joseph brought his brothers before the throne, the same men who were guilty of evil against him, and Jesus Christ will one day present the believer faultless before the presence of his, that's God's glory, according to Jude 24. Joseph, if you remember as we studied in Genesis 49, Joseph is pictured as a vine in the word bow. Uh, that is described about Joseph in Genesis 49, 22. We've already studied that verse as we dealt with each blessing to each one of the sons. But Jesus Christ said of himself, I am the true vine. But what do we also find... And lastly, for this message, is that Joseph was a savior of man from certain death. In Genesis 47, verse 19, notice with me, Genesis 47, 19, Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land, Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. So there was, right, the Egyptian uh, people, they were going to die. Joseph's brethren, his family, were going to die because the famine was so sore in the land. And so Joseph, in the earthly sense, was a savior of man from certain death. If Joseph was not there to give them what they needed, these people would have all died. And Jesus Christ is the Savior of man from certain judgment, from the wrath of God that is appending upon every man. All who believe in Christ, the Bible says in John 3.16, will not perish, but have everlasting life. 
I want you to go with me now to Genesis 45, to the words of Joseph as he first revealed himself to his brothers. Notice with me, verse 5, Genesis 45, 5. Now therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Verse 7. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And again in Genesis 50, in verse 19 and 20, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is, it, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Perhaps the greatest way in the which Joseph pictures the Lord Jesus Christ is an understanding of God's wisdom, of God's plan, that would seem on the surface as an evil thing, and yet God uses that evil to accomplish something wonderful. We have already read, if you remember in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached, he preaches to a multitude of people, and we know that there were thousands of people who were converted on that day, but as he begins to expound on the Lord Jesus Christ, he calls him Jesus of Nazareth in Acts chapter 2, verse 22. And he preaches to them and he says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him, now notice the wording, verse 23, Acts 2, 23, him, that is Christ, being delivered, or we could also say sent, by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Notice he's not done. Ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You see, the words of Joseph in Genesis 45 and in Genesis 50 is exactly what Peter is preaching in Acts chapter 2. Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. And uh, here, Peter is preaching, he says, You have taken, and by wicked hands, you have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have slain him. And what you've done was a mighty wicked thing. And yet, at the very same time, Peter recognizes that despite the evil of man, no matter what man did, the truth of the cross, the truth of salvation, it is not the doing of man, it is the doing of God. And we find that although they took the Lord Jesus Christ, and although they physically grabbed him, they physically slapped him, beat him, whipped him, tore his garment, put a crown of thorn on his head, slapped him, blindfolded him, spat upon him, and uh, treated him as if he was less than human. And God said, and, and Peter says, you've taken him, you've, you've slain, this is what you've done to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is a mighty evil thing and the truth of the cross is that although we acknowledge that those people are those who crucified Jesus Christ the Bible tells us very clearly that uh, that uh, Jesus Christ was delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God Jesus Christ the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world his death on the cross was already in the mind of God. When man sinned, God did not say, Oops, I didn't know that would happen. Before the foundation of the world, 
God had in his mind a plan that he would send his son, he would deliver his son in the hands of wicked men who would use him, who would mistreat him, and who would handle him, the one who had created them, the very one who gives them the breath that they breathe, the one by whom all things consist. They took him and they crucified, but Peter said, you crucified him, but God did it for you to save you. God used your evil, your wicked mind, your evil heart. And yet, you can find salvation in Him. Now, what happened to those people that heard that message? Notice what happens in verse 37 of the same chapter. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's a good question. Do you know who was saying that? The same people who crucified Christ. That's what he said. That's what you did. You've taken by wicked hands. You've crucified and slain. You have done that. But lest we point the finger, and we know that that was prophesied in Genesis chapter twenty uh, or, or uh, Isaiah chapter fifty-three, Psalm twenty-two. The death of Christ was already prophesied. We knew how it was going to happen, and we knew what was going to happen when Jesus Christ would uh, die on the cross. It's not a surprise when we come to uh, the New Testament. And so these people who had. Crucified, shouted, crucify him, had indeed taken him, crucified him. But there are more people who crucified the Lord Jesus Christ than just those who were present on that day. Now, you and I may not have been there. But I believe that you and I have all sinned and we've all come short of the glory of God. We are all by birth and by our natural tendencies, we are all under the wrath of a holy God. And the Bible tells us, as Paul puts it in the letter to the church at Corinth, he says, God hath made him. Okay, God hath made him Christ. So notice, it was not man that made him anything. God hath made him Christ to be sin for us. Who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That's what happened. God hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I want you to turn with me to the book of Colossians. In the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Colossae, and he's talking about many things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice with me, verse 10. Colossians 2, verse 10. The Bible says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. That is salvation. What is salvation? We are baptized, risen with him, through the faith and the operation of God. That's salvation. All right? Who hath raised him, Christ, from the dead. So also we are raised in him. Verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Verse 14, how did he do that? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And that's not 
All he did, verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And so we ask ourselves here, God hath made him to be sin for us. And so we, we, we know that he became sin, but the question is, whose sin or what sin? And the Bible says that when we were redeemed by the operation of God, what happened on the cross of Calvary is that all of the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, everything that is evil in the sight of God, everything that is wicked, whether it is in deed, in thought, or in the motive of the heart, everything that stands as unholy, ungodly, unrighteous before a holy God is all written there. There is a record of that. And that record stands against man. And we know that the law was given so that all the world might become guilty before God and so that every mouth can be stopped. And so as we all stand before God, we don't walk around trying to justify ourselves. We don't walk around saying, well, look at how good I am. Look at how wonderful I am. We can only say in the sight of God and His holiness and His law and His righteousness that we are sinners, we are undone. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, understand, all the handwriting of ordinances that was against us were nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. All the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, they were nailed to His cross. And what did He do with that? all the handwriting of ordinances that was against us? He took it out of the way. That's what happened on the cross. So yes, Jesus became sin for us, but He took our sin upon Himself. That's why we call him or refer to him as the substitutionary atonement for the sins of man. He had no sin, but he took our sin. That is what God accomplished for us. And those who hated God and hated Christ crucified him and God yet used their evil to save those same people. And guess what? Some of those people who crucified him got saved. What a transformation in their lives. Crucify him! Crucify him! And just a few chapters later in Acts, they're going everywhere preaching Jesus Christ. <laughs> Something happened in their life. What happened? They did evil and God used their evil for their sake. So certainly Joseph is a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Although all pictures of any man will always be inadequate, Joseph is a mighty good picture of Christ. And not only that, but also I believe that we, as we've studied the life of Joseph, ought to be challenged to follow the example of Joseph in his response, in his life, but also for us personally, the desire of our hearts should not to be like jo not to, for us not to be like Joseph, our desire should be to be like Christ. <laughs> because Joseph sought to emulate the Lord. And we in our lives must do the same. And so may the Lord help us to look at Joseph and may this account encourage us because we look at the life of Joseph and we may think it's terrible. And for what he went through, we could say it is terrible. But I say to us, look at what God did with that. God knew that Joseph was going to save the world. And we may look at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and we may say that's terrible what they did to, to Jesus Christ. And it is. But look at what God did with that. He saved you. He saved you. You know why we have evil things happen to us? Why does God allow it? Because God, in His wisdom, not only does not take us through a temptation that we are not able to bear, 
He also make a way of, makes a way of escape. But also what God does, and that's the wonder about God, is that he will take evil things happening in our lives and he will change them for the good. That's what God does. That's the kind of God we serve. And if you would, in the life of Joseph, in the, book of, the first book of the Bible, in the life of Joseph himself, there's a wonderful picture of not only what the Christian life is supposed to be like, but also a picture of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so may the Lord use the account of Genesis to encourage our hearts. To see if Joseph went through all those things. Is not God great enough and sufficient enough? Not only to take Joseph through what he went through, but also that God would take me through what I'm going to go through. And I tell you that God is great enough. And he will bring you through. And in the end, I believe, in the moment we may not know at why or when, but in the end we will say, to God be the glory. Great things he hath done.